And yes, welcome. We are live here at CIUT 89.5 FM. And who are we? We are three women and your host, Sherry DeNovo, MPP Parkdale High Park. Uh, delighted to be back here in studio. And we have a wonderful show lined up. It's all about alternative health, which I'm sure we're thinking of this time of year. We should be. Uh, and I have in-studio guests. I have call-in guests. Uh, we're, we're talking to women who really have made inroads in this area and, of course, are always in interested in speaking to you. So if you want to give us a shout, do that. 416-946-7000. That is our on-air line. Or you can tweet me at C-H-E-R-I-D-I-N-O-V-O. And that will get my attention as well. And that way you can be part of the conversation. So all about women and alternative health on Three Women Today. And we're going to start off with Tracy TF, who is my in-studio guest. Uh, uh, Tracy, so you know, is the founder of Anaris uh, Natural Health Apothecary, and that's at Bloor and Dovercourt. And welcome, Tracy, to Three Women. Hi. Uh, you have come from quite a line of women to, who've been involved in alternative health. Ta- tell us about your mother and your grandmother. Well, my grandmother on my father's side um, immigrated to Canada um, from Buenos Aires, and she established a health farm um, in northern Alberta, north of Edmonton. What is uh, a health farm? Well, I, I don't know. I don't know what to call it. She had a farm, and she healed people with polio and and uh, with uh, diabetes. She did. Th- she healed people with diabetes, um, presumably adult onset diabetes. Um, with diet, uh, feeding them, like, for instance, a pound of beans a day for inulin. Um, and she also was a firm believer in raw goat's milk and alfalfa, <laughs> as far as I know. Um, and with with uh, people with polio, the, the traditional, the convention was to keep people immobilized. But rather than that, she had them doing farm work. She did massage with them and uh, a lot of raw foods in their diet. And these people did not develop post-polio. Sim- syndrome and when she died she was recognized as Canada's first physiotherapist fantastic yeah my mother was an occupational health nurse one of the first in Canada and there's a there's a lifetime achievement award uh, named after her so her name was Gay Thomas and she did a lot for workplace health and safety so now you you picked up the the family mantle here and this tradition a feminist tradition and started the apothecary. What's special about your apothecary? What makes it any different from others? Well, I think if you're a person who's interested in traditional medicine um, and in uh, in natural health and in uh, in being as kind to the environment as you can, when you walk in the store, you'll see all the kind of wonderful things that you've been looking for. That's what people told me yesterday when they came and did all their holiday shopping. I sell alternatives to plastics. I sell natural contraceptive options um, and all kinds of wonderful concoctions and things like like uh, like uh, happy bee candles and um Natural contraceptive options. Tell us a little bit about that. Sounds fascinating. Well, when I first started practicing, I was doing a lot of um, consulting around hormone balancing with women um, who were coming off the pill, who were finding themselves infertile, or who were very sick on the pill, um, and even three women who had breast cancer. And I was, uh, you know, going through the contraceptive options, uh, I suggested the cervical cap. And... uh, you know, women went off and said, there is no such thing as the cervical cap. And I'm like, that's ridiculous. Uh, so eventually, I, you know, I contacted people. I found out that diaphragms and cervical caps and things like this were just not available. And I spent two years finding out how to make them available. So I now have a number of products um, that are virtually impossible to get anywhere else in North America. I have the Kaya diaphragm and um, Kaya gel. I have uh, a Contragel Green and um, the Fem Cap, which is uh, uh, was invented by a, a brave soul uh, and a doctor named uh, Dr. Shahada. He's located in California, um, and I I sell these all over the world. Uh, as and and also I, I carry cycle beads. And cycle, cycle beads were developed by um, Georgetown University um, based on the very very ancient uh, counting method. 
And the thing that's remarkable about cycle beads uh, and the standard days method is it's 95% effective with no intervention. It's shocking to me that cervical caps and diaphragms aren't available. I mean, those were in my day, and I'm, we're going back a bit in my day, but um, those were sort of standard options. And they should be available in every drugstore alongside of condoms. They're not more complicated to use. Very bizarre. Well, I, could, I could see, I mean, the, the Western medical voice in my head is saying, yes, but condoms are also have the advantage of preventing disease as well, obviously. So. Yes, but I mean, what over-the-counter medicine, the intention of something that's mm -hmm. over-the-counter is that there's, there's not much plausible harm that can come mm -hmm. for someone picking this up, and, and they, can, they can more or less use it effectively if they read the instructions. So, so the only reason why natural contraceptive options are not available at every drugstore is because the hormonal contraceptive lobby actively works to keep them out of the market. And they will buy the license for a diaphragm, say, or a cervical cap, they will buy it so that they can discontinue it. That's wacky. Um, now, again, you know, for, for most people who are, and I, I think there are a lot of people out there who really are on pharmaceuticals of one sort or another and see this as a lifetime pattern. Um, it was an, there was an interesting question asked, I think, of somebody that I uh, was researcher in the alternative health field who said one of the questions you should be asking your traditional doctor is how long will I be on this medication? Mm -hmm. um, in other words, and when we can th we think of some of the uh, prescriptions for psychiatric issues, but also things like hypertension and other things where the expectation really from the Western point of view is you're going to be on this forever. Mm -hmm. um, are there alternatives? I mean, people, that's when people start looking for alternatives, I think, and said, you know, if, if they do some investigative research at all, which is difficult to do. I mean, it's, it's try finding, I mean, let's take hypertension, try looking on for persistent hypertension, try looking on the net and finding alternative information. It's, it's virtually impossible mm -hmm. to find this. Mm -hmm. Is there, how do you find it? Where, where does one find alternative information about alternative therapies for classic kind of uh, conditions that seem to be lifelong? Well, traditional medicine is quite comprehensive and thorough. Uh, you have to look in the nooks and crannies for it, but there's nothing that a human being has ever experienced that traditional medicine has not has not uh, explored answers for. Um, I would, if, if I were looking at hypertension, um, uh, I would, I would want to know how severe it was. Uh, I might refer the person to a doctor of Chinese medicine. I do work with a wonderful doctor of Chinese medicine. I refer people to her. Her name is uh, Adina Stanescu, and she has the TCM clinic on DuPont. Um, and uh, so, so I do trust traditional Chinese medicine when it comes to um, organ system uh, mm -hmm. problems. Um, and what sort of things might they do? Then if somebody went to them. Well, th there are herbal regimens, right. and there's a whole diagnostic system that's that's different from the Western model. Mm -hmm. So I don't pretend to know all of that, mm -hmm. but Chinese medicine is the longest running, con continuously running system of medicine on the planet, um, and so uh, it has its own language and its own its own uh, materia medica. Um, but when it comes to an organ system problem, I would definitely recommend traditional Chinese medicine. Um, when I look online for um, for herbal remedies, I look to master herbalists, uh, people who follow in a, a strong tradition of medicine. Um, and uh, and there are always answers because we humans have always uh, have always used plant medicine to heal ourselves. Mm -hmm. I mean, for that matter, traditional pharmaceuticals are usually based on some... Some 94% of mm -hmm. pharmaceutical medication is based on plant medicine, probably more. Some, some say 98%. Um, and there are some medicines that simply cannot be synthesized, like digitalis, um, and no one knows why. Um, from an herbalism point of view, plants are complex, and we, we don't in herbalism follow the doctrine of active ingredients the same way 
in the in the way that um, Western medicine um, now does. So when we look at an herb, we look at it as a synergistic medicine that all of the chemical components work together to uh, eliminate side effects, um, um, to to begin the healing, and also to shut it down when the work is done. Plants. When we talk about that, we talk about plants having intelligence. We say things have plants have a medicine has plant intelligence because it knows when to stop working. When we are working with a, a doctrine of active ingredients, we say there's just this one thing that does what we want. So we're going to isolate it. Maybe we're going to synthesize it. We're going to concentrate it, and it acts like an arrow. It just keeps going even when you need it to stop. Mm -hmm. So it has no intelligence. One of the questions, of course, always is testing. You know, how ha, has this, and again, you know, if you read, look at medical journals or you look at Western medicine, there are those, you know, blind tests. There are the testing procedures for the efficacy of some particular um, approach to a disease, let's say. Is that testing being done on alternative therapies? Well, like I say, Chinese medicine has been a continuously running system for thousands of years, let's say 5,000. Um, and, and tests are done continuously um, in, in Asia, um, looking at the efficacy of various uh, herbal protocols. Here in the West, um, because there's because funding is generally tied to financial benefit, we don't have as much research. We have very little real research. And I, I do subscribe to a number of journals uh, looking at, uh, at herbal medicine and, and biological medicine. And what's striking is that, what's striking to me, and I hope this doesn't sound arrogant or offensive, is just that the ignorance of the research design, in, in the research design, um, they may be testing a plant and, you know, it's a good thing when they actually name the Latin botanical name in the abstract, but they don't talk about where it's grown, the climate it was grown, the season it was grown in. When you don't know those things, you don't know the chemical, you can't guess at the chemical constituents. And if I were going to run a research protocol, I would do a, a gas chromatograph on every single um, bit of plant medicine that we were testing just to know what I'm dealing with. So I, th I think that uh, Western medicine has a, uh, a long ways to, to catch up. And um, if, if they really do want to discover um, the healing benefits of, of uh, herbal medicine and aromatherapy, I would suggest that they actually contact a, a, a medical herbalist <coughs> or an aromatherapist and, and ask us to help them design that research so that it's actually useful. Mm -hmm. And of course, it's extremely expensive as well. When uh, when we do these these tests, and not everyone can afford to do them, but large pharmaceutical companies can. And there's no interest in owning plants. And mm -hmm. I, you know, it's it's the it's the end of the world from my point of view when pharmaceutical companies decide that they would they, that they would be able to own a plant. Mm -hmm. I know that Nestle is going after fennel right now. Really, they want to own fennel as a remedy. For thousands of years, people have used fennel, um, you know, for the it's burpees something that and, you and can for growing your garden, and we and, have, <laughs> yeah, and 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 for babies and colic, and uh, it's it's astounding that they're going after that, but it, it's also horrifying to think that they may succeed in owning that plant. Yeah, uh, if you just tuned in, uh, you're in for a treat. Uh, you're listening to Three Women. I'm your host, Sherry DeNovo, MPP Park, Delhi Park. And it's all about women and alternative uh, medicine these days. Um, we have in, uh, in the studio, and you've been listening to her, Tracy T.F., who owns Anaris Apothecary on Bloor and Davenport. Um, Delvercourt. So, sorry, Dovercourt. And we're just joined by uh, a wonderful new guest, uh, Dr. Teresa Tsusui. Is that, uh, did I pronounce it correctly? And uh, Teresa is a doctor of, natu uh, of natu uh, naturopathy, um, and she also works for INCAN Research Net um, and uh, works with faculty of pharmacy at U of T. And Teresa, you just joined this conversation at the perfect time, which is we're speaking about uh, testing 
the, the actual research that goes into alternative therapies. There's lots of research done on traditional Western therapies, but there's very little research done on alternative therapies. And we, we talked about why that is. It's expensive. There's not a lot of vested interest behind testing a, an herb versus a pharmaceutical product. But you're obviously involved in the research. Can you talk to, to us a little bit about the research that's been doing, uh, done or being done on alternative therapies? A lot of research uh, has been done is ongoing as well on uh, being done on complementary and alternative medicine. Um, and, and increasingly this term is shifting and becoming integrative medicine. So it is um, really a changing field. And, and tell me about that research. Tell us about that research. Oh, uh, research from, um, you know, looking at how people can work together as um, clinics, also human clinical trials, animal studies, test tube studies, the whole gamut of research is being, being done. done. Oh, that's fantastic. And what are we, uh, what are you discovering? Any interesting things that sort of jump to your mind when you think about research and alternative therapies? So I guess in my role as the manager of the InCam Research Network mm -hmm. at the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy, I um, help to just manage the day-to-day -day operations of a research network. And many of our uh, members um, you know, have their own research teams. I work with Dr. Heather Boone, who is the Dean of Pharmacy at the university here. So we look at um, a range of different things. So from, um, uh, I guess, even, uh, you know, how whole systems research can be done better, um, looking at the even the term complementary and alternative medicine is, um, uh, I guess, the, the term that's being used now, but it used to be alternative medicine. And um, m moving forward, uh, people are using integrative medicine more too. So even the field and the language that we use to describe the field is changing. Um, there's a, a lot of research and I know that uh, Linda Bonneves will be joining later mm -hmm. um, is the director of the uh, Center for Integrative Medicine. So there's a lot of potential for what can be done and I think how we can look at you know the whole plant, we can look at whole systems and also examine it from a research lens too. Uh, so, I mean, I guess, the, the and by the way, please, uh, if you've got a question, we've got two experts in studio and somebody else is going to be joining us by phone in a short while, and it's 416-946-7000. If you have a question about alternative therapies and complementary therapies, uh, we've got uh, some wonderful women in studio. So, again, 416-946-7000. Or if you're one of those shy ones and you want to tweet me a question or a comment, please do that at C-H-E-R-I-D-I-N-O-V-O. -I -I -O. I'm looking at my BlackBerry every minute, and I will pick that up and uh, carry it into the conversation. So the, the big question uh, is, do alternative and complementary therapies work? Do they help? I mean, that would be the big question. And I can tell you that for most GPs, if you walk into a, an office for a doctor, they're, most of the ones I've heard of do not make recommendations in that regard. They're, they sit there with a prescription pad and will write you uh, a prescription. So, Chisa. Well, I think it really does. Uh, it de uh, depends on what you're asking because uh, complementary and alternative medicine is a really broad field, um, just as, you know, you can even pose the same questions. Do drugs work? Um, you know, it depends. It depends on which drug for which indication and what is the outcome that you're looking at. So there are many um, complementary and alternative therapies that work. You just have to ask the right question. And, um, and it really depends on who you're asking. Okay, so we were taking some and, and Tracy, feel free to jump in on this conversation. We were talking about, you know, the kinds of things where, uh, the kinds of uh, yeah. uh, conditions where someone would be on a, a regimen, a drug regimen for a long time. So, um, and if there is some kind of, we're just uh, fixing uh, microphones as we speak here. Uh, if there, what, what might someone look for? Because I think people are really hesitant to question their doctors recommendations if they're a traditional uh, Western doctor and second of all to know how something can work with or 
getting off the number of drugs, and this becomes particularly pertinent for, I think, our seniors or older people who are on a lot of different drug regimens and, and getting off them is not always easy or accessible. So, so I walk into your apothecary or I walk mm -hmm. into your practice um, and I'm, and we, we talk about hypertension, for example. Here's something that a lot of people suffer from that as they get older. Uh, you've got high blood pressure, you're on three or sometimes more drugs through a tradi traditional Western. You, you're not overweight, you're trying to exercise, but of course nobody's perfect any of these things in your diet or exercise. What do, what do you say to them, uh, Teresa, if they walk into your office and you're in, a, in, in your practice and they say, we, I don't want to be on these traditional drugs forever, I'm concerned about them, what can I do? What would you say? So if the patient's goal is to slowly wean off of the medications, I need to um, open the lines of communication with their doctor. Um, I take a thorough history, look at which drugs they're on. Um, I look at their stage of their hypertension, um, other um, comorbidities or other ongoing health concerns that may be impacting how, how likely they can come off of their medications. And then uh, I work with them. You know, so there's diet that I can recommend, there are herbs, there may be um, nutrition, and I really do try to adopt an evidence-informed practice. So I try to look at, you know, what has been researched and also what works and maybe what doesn't work too. And I also keep in mind um, interactions because interactions can be negative where someone may say, uh, increase their chance of bleeding, or they could be positive too, where they, um, the outcome is they, they need to take less of their medication. Right. Why should they even bother doing this, I suppose? Is, you know, why should they look alternatively? What are the long-term effects of being on a regimen of traditional pharmaceutical drugs? Um, that might make one look alternatively. Well, well pe people come to me when they're when they're uh, fed up. Either they've so sometimes they're just at the beginning of a diagnosis and they don't like what they've been told their options are. But most often people are at the end of some kind of road. They're fed up because they're fed up with side effects. They're fed up with how they're treated. They're fed up with um, the expense. And, and they, they don't want to be an experiment, experimental, uh, they don't want to be a guinea pig. They, they see themselves, off, often people who come to me see themselves as, as, as guinea pigs for the, for the medical profession because their doctors, they, they get the sense that their doctor doesn't really know what's going on. Mm -hmm. I think that herbalists and alternative medical practitioners are, find it easier to say, I don't know, <laughs> or we don't know find it easier to say here are some here are a bunch of options which which ones suit you which ones uh, and and like you're talking about opening up a conversation because there isn't a pat answer you don't take a rubber stamp and stamp it on someone's forehead and you're good to go it's it's an ongoing uh, it's an ongoing uh, dialogue not just with the with the client but or patient but a di that patient's ongoing dialogue with themselves and their families and their lifestyle mm -hmm. and their health. What's most important to them? I think something that's interesting about uh, the alternative medicine that I practice is I ask people, what are the three conditions that bother you the most? And it doesn't matter what your doctor thinks are the three most important conditions. What are the three things that bother you the most? And we, we, take, we take that approach when we check in. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I'm not talking about, you know, treating congestive heart failure here, <laughs> um, but, uh, the, the focus on the patient is quite, is, is quite strikingly, uh, different, um, from conventional medicine. So when, when people, when people come to an alternative, uh, uh, medical approach, they, they understand that they're an active participant and they want that. Mm-hmm. And Dr. Sui, what, and I, I guess the other question to me, and you can weigh in on that one as well, is uh, how do you decipher when you, if you're exploring alternative therapies and complementary medicines, who's, who's legitimate and who's not legitimate in that field, just like anything else? Right? How, would they, how, would they, how would the consumer find you, for example? Yeah, um, I don't have any more to add to what has already been said, and I t definitely agree that patient-rated outcomes is important. Um, what people uh, feel is important to them has to be addressed. Um, 
Legitimacy. I mean, that's a that's a very good question. I think we can look at regulated health professions, and I think if we agree to um, the scientific approach, uh, at least you know basing your recommendations uh, on science, I think would lend um, you know some legitimacy. I mean, it's not the whole thing, you know. Expert opinion is a form of um, evidence as well, although I would argue that, um, you know, human clinical trials may be stronger evidence if more people have uh, tried it and that it works and it's safe. Mm -hmm. Now, you're working with pharmacists. Uh, it's, it's kind of, it, it, it blows my mind to think that a pharmacist would, would recommend an herb. I, I've never had that happen. Do they? Do pharmacists now, if you go in with a prescription, would they say, you might also try XYZ? Or how do pharmacists incorporate alternative and complementary medicines in their practices? How would that, what does that look like? I mean, we have a lady over here who's running an apothecary, and that's very clear, but for a traditional pharmacist, somebody who's trained at U of T and graduates and goes out and works for, you know, a, 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 a drugstore, um, do, are they doing that? Are they recommending something other than what the doctor has written for them? So natural health products in Canada are regulated as over-the-counter um, self-care products. Um, some argue are a form of drug because they contain uh, pharmacologically active constituents. Um, I know the drug term is charged and some people don't like it. However, because it is over-the-counter, it is in the scope of practice for pharmacists. So like other self-care products, um, pharmacists learn about natural health products, and uh, I think often it's a consumer-driven question. So patients will come in asking about, oh, I want to take vitamin C for my cold. What do you think? Which form should I take? How much? And so pharmacists will, will, will make the recommendation based on based on the question and the need. Mm -hmm. But but consumer-driven rather mm -hmm. than pharmacist-driven. Most of the time. What, what do you find when folk come in? I mean, you run a very different kind of drugstore, as it <laughs> yeah, were. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm completely mm -hmm. on, I'm cl completely in outer space co compared mm -hmm. to a regulated profession like like uh, naturopaths are. Right. Yeah, although, although the, I'm a certified natural health practitioner, the intention, uh, and that's a federal designation through the Canadian Examining Board of Healthcare Practitioners. The intention was, I think, that it would be regulated, but it's not. And it, the, in terms of how, um, in terms of the difference differences between the trainings, um, a CNHP uh, would would have a lot more physical. Like what is massage. a CNHP again? Let's certified just natural health okay, practitioner right. would would have a lot more experience uh, with with body work. And and you know direct hands-on healing, whereas a naturopath has has more of the pharmacological. I've I've taken a path uh, because I'm fascinated with with um, organic chemistry. I've taken a path very much uh, in in uh, making medicines hol holistic aromatherapy medicines, medicines that are administered administered through the skin. So I'm an aromatherapist which most people think is like, hey, it's a nice smell, that's cool. But, of course, uh, essential oils are strong pharmacological agents. So uh, that's that's the path I've taken with the CNHP. Mm -hmm. okay. I don't Dr. Sue, have you done any research on uh, aromatherapy and on essential oils? Has that come into your purview? Not specifically, but I do know that they're very powerful. Um, essential oils, um, you know, have antimicrobial effects. They can have uh, calming effects on the body. Um, and there are also side effects, too, you mm -hmm. know, um, that we have to watch out for. So I know there's at least a case report on uh, aromatherapy. I think it was uh, lavender that is linked with... Um, uh, breast growth in males. So, you know, we have to be very careful with using these um, and respecting them. Because I, I think, think the, the interesting, I, I've looked at the studies of, of lavender and the estrogenic effects. And I think by the time it hits the popular media, there are so many embroiled misunderstandings. One, one of them is that, that somehow phytoestrogens are, or plant estrogens are just, are just in lavender or just in fennel or just in anise. Whereas I, I talk about phy phytoestrogens being in all plants. That estrogen is a communication hormone on planet Earth. It's, 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 it's everywhere. And, and the lavender studies that, that have been done, I would say, 
we're not informed by aromatherapists. So the problem is, is those lavenders, we don't know where they came from, how they were grown. Um, I, uh, I haven't seen, maybe I've only read the abstracts, but I haven't seen any kind of gas chromatograph to tell us exactly what the constituents of that lavender were. And the, the other thing is that when science takes on something that alternative medicine does, they're not necessarily practicing it the way alternative medical practitioners are practicing it. So, you know, for instance, there was a lavender study, does lavender relieve pain? And this is hilarious. Does lavender relieve pain? So what they did is they had, I think it was something pitiful, like seven subjects, and they made them smell balls of cotton to see if it helped heal their cut faster and relieve the pain. And that is n that is not mm -hmm. what an alternative medical mm -hmm. practitioner would do mm -hmm. um, to, to use lavender re to relieve pain. We'd actually use it topically. Well, we're going to talk to uh, Dr. Tatsui and also um, to Tracy TF uh, a little bit more about this when we get back. We've got to take a break and pay some bills, uh, listen to the station ID, and maybe two. And we'll be back shortly on Three Women. Right here, right now, every day. CIUT 89.5, Toronto. Sound of your city. of joy and peace oh I wish I had a river I could skate away on but it don't snow here it stays pretty green I'm gonna make a lot of money then I'm gonna quit this crazy scene I wish I had a river I could skate away on I wish I had a river so long I would teach my feet to fly Oh, I wish I had a river I could skate away on I made my baby cry to help me you know he put me at ease and he loved me so naughty made me weak in the knees oh i wish i had a river i could skate away on i'm so hard to handle i'm selfish and i'm sad now i gone and lost the best baby that i ever had oh i wish i had a river I could skate away on I wish I had a river so long I would teach my feet to fly Putting up reindeer, singing songs of joy and peace. I wish I had a river, I could skate away
kind of a gray day, and that was kind of a soft song. So we're going to wake up a little bit here. You're listening to Three Women. I'm your host, Sherry DeNovo, MPP Park Delhi Park. And in studio, I'm delighted to have Dr. Teresa Tsui and Tracy TF, uh, both involved in complementary and alternative medicines, and we were just talking about lavender. Um, also, of course, if you have a question, if you have a concern, here's some experts you can ask at 416 or just tweet me at C-H-E-R-I-D-I-N-O-V-O. Thank you for your comments so far. Um, and Dr. Tsui, let's go back to you. Let's talk about what constitutes a, an effective trial of complementary medicines. And what, you know, people, every so often they hit the news, lavender, for example. What should people do when they hear news about lavender, for example, and what really constitutes an appropriate test or not? So what constitutes an appropriate test um, is just a few things. So often if a, a large number of humans are involved and analysis has been done on the results, so a meta-analysis would be a very powerful uh, type of study, um, a, a well-conducted randomized control trial with many humans would be also a very good trial. Um, and earlier we talked about some side effects of essential oils, including lavender oil. So um, there was a case report that linked uh, lavender with development of um, gynecomastia or breast, breast growth in males. So it that kind of a case report does not establish causation like a randomized control trial can. So we really cannot say that lavender oil causes breast growth in males. We can, can only I, say it's correlated. Ask, yes. Mm -hmm. Can I ask how much lavender oil were they using and how and why? I'd have to go back to the study. I read it a number of years ago when it first came out, and I actually did a journal club presentation on this at the Naturopathic College. It was um, periodical use. It wasn't, uh, I can't remember the details of the study, mm -hmm. and I really, you know, and one of the huge flaws was because it is a case report, it was just linked with, with use, um, mm -hmm. and we can't say that it causes mm -hmm. um, anything. So it Anybody out there who's taken any course in science at any time in their lives will know the difference between causation and correlation. So this is the problem with the news that we get about complementary and alternative medicines, though. I mean, it's the problem we get in news about traditional medicine, uh, you know, Western medicine as well, I should say. Um, so again, this is a problem. Uh, uh, but, I mean, suffice to say, so somebody walks into your office, you have a clinical practice, um, they're looking at all, and they probably, I mean, I think Tracy's right, and they probably, most people would walk into alternative therapies or ask questions when everything else doesn't work, like, doesn't seem to be working, you know, I still feel crappy, and yet I'm doing everything my, doc my Western doctor tells me to do, what do you have to offer me, which is... Mm -hmm. Kind of also not very fair for you either, but anyway, <laughs> uh, and, and, and again, what is what does it look like to walk into your office, Dr. Tsui, and um, with that kind of concern, what and what what do you do with a patient? What does it look like to have a consult with you? So, um, you ask a good question. With um, patients, you know, some patients will see me because they're dissatisfied with the conventional medical system, and if that's the case, I you know I really take a thorough history. I, you know, I do physical exams, I look at their blood work and really try to examine, um, you know, really what the issue is and what hasn't been resolved. Or maybe they're uh, suffering, as I think Tracy had mentioned earlier, from some side effects of, of medications, or they are looking at avoiding surgery, um, you know, that happens. Um, or, or maybe they're trying to prevent going on medications. That's also a common one. I just work with them. Um, I, you know, as a naturopathic doctor, will use the range of treatments that I'm trained in. So uh, from, um, you know, botanical medicine, natural health products, dietary counseling, and uh, and then I will I'll just design an individualized approach um, for the patient. What made you decide to do that route and not the traditional medical route when you thought about going into medicine? I have always been interested in helping people, and I, I saw there was huge potential in research, actually, in um, complementary and alternative medicine. It was the research that drew me into the field, and uh, I'm still doing research. I also thought that uh, because I have been using herbs for a long time in my life, and I, I found that they worked, but I just did not know why they worked. So I was really interested in the research potential and in also using um, natural medicines to help people. 
And, and what research are you working on right now? Is there something that's kind of happening, ongoing, that we'll hear about at some point? Well, I mean, I'm uh, really... Well, you, uh, I'm I, I'm I'm really actually applying for a PhD program now, so mm-hmm. I, I'm refining my research project. I I'm interested in patient um, uh, rated outcomes, and so you know what as I think as Tracy had said, what the patient thinks is important. Um, I, I don't have much experience in that field, but I do know that it's an area that needs to be examined because of my clinical practice. And let's talk to both of you about the placebo effect, um, mm-hmm. because that's always comes up in these discussions as well. You know, if people expect to get better, they tend to get better. If they expect to get worse, they tend to get worse. Uh, uh, is is this something that you hear about, and is this something that you experience? I want to write a book about it. <laughs> I think the placebo effect is, um, you know, 50% of all healing. And what, what it is for me is when the person... When the person has a strong intention and they and they're starting, it's they're saying to their body, "We're we're going to heal now. We're starting. The healing starts now." And so the placebo effect is really a communication to the body uh, to to start healing. And it's important to note that it, this is true of traditional Western medicine everything. as well as alternative everything. medicine. It works for everything. Uh, Dr. Sui, do you want to weigh in on that? Yes, I think the placebo effect is very powerful. And um, as Tracy mentioned, you know, conventional drugs, antidepressants being one example, you know, have, a, have, have been shown to have a very powerful placebo effect too. I think this also speaks to the mind-body connection. And uh, when people, uh, you know, believe that something is working, um, there is a, a stronger effect, it seems. Um, and also, I think the placebo effect is given bad press. Um, and there's negative connotation linked with the placebo effect when maybe we can, um, I think, maybe make good use of it, um, even if it is a placebo effect. Yeah, that's why I, re- I refer to it as the healing effect. Yeah, the healing effect. It's not a trick. It's not, you didn't just trick yourself. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's a real you, effect. You began healing. You're and actually that's, healing. Yeah. That's great. And, you, and it wasn't the outside agent that we can say started that healing. It was the communication yeah. that started it. And we have a caller. Welcome to Three Women. Who am I speaking to? Hello? Hi, it's Linda Balneves. Oh, Hi, hi L- Linda. So this is Professor uh, Linda Balneves, and she's uh, also uh, an investigator, co-investigator on clinical trials um, at CAM Therapies, and, uh, and this is, uh, of course, through U of T as well. So welcome to the show. Thank you so much. Yeah, and, and let us know, I just asked uh, Dr. Tsui about this, but t- what are you working on these days? What are you looking at? Well, I've just joined the University of Toronto as the new director for the Center for Integrative Medicine. Uh, so we're just really busy getting the center off the ground and establishing our priorities and our strategies around developing research around complementary and integrative medicine, as well as uh, developing some education priorities as well as working with some of the local clinical institutions in developing integrative medical uh, practices. So uh, a lot of setup right now um, and not as much focusing on my own research program at this time. Uh, but that's, it's exciting to know that you, University of Toronto, I mean, I think this is kind of exciting and novel to a lot of people listening to the show this morning that uh, University of Toronto, that serious, you know, the pharmaceutical department, that serious so-called quotes unquote scientists are really looking now seriously at alternative and complementary medicine, that this isn't just some hippie thing off in a corner somewhere, <laughs> um, but that it, it actually is being studied. Um, it, do you hope to, to bring you know, what would you hope will come out of all of this, Linda, in your studies? Right. I, mean, I really think, uh, you know, the, one of the, the largest goals of the center will be to improve care and ensure that uh, patients and families have access to any therapy, be it from a conventional medical perspective or from a complementary medical perspective. Uh, if there's evidence that it's safe and that it works and that it's cost effective in our healthcare system, we want to ensure that Canadians are having access to those therapies. So, yeah. I'm going to ask a a politically charged question now, and that is, uh, do you get pushback from big pharma? Do you get, I mean, I know that a lot of money that goes into medical research, that goes into any of the research to do with health, does come from pharmaceutical companies. Does it, are are there strings attached with that money? Are you finding it hard to get funding? What's what's the scoop, Linda? Why don't Mm -hmm. you start off on that? 
Sure. Um, you know, it, it, I will be honest. You know, I've done research in this area for 18 years. It is um, it's more challenging to get research in this field because we, we you know, don't necessarily study products that you can get a patent on. It's hard to patent mind-body medicine or, or a natural uh, health product. Um, but that being said, we're seeing, uh, you know, the public coming forward through donations. We're seeing foundations that are interested in this field. And I think as we start to generate more evidence, we are seeing, you know, the larger federal funding bodies acknowledge that if these therapies are effective um, and they also can perhaps save the system money, I think we're seeing uh, a greater deal of interest. Uh, from the mainstream in terms of funding this type of research. So I think we're we're just in that moment of seeing a real pivotal change in how uh, funding is being given towards integrative medicine. Now, Tracy was talking about the possible patenting of something like fennel uh, by a company. Um, are you seeing any evidence of that? You know, uh, to be honest, you know, there is drug development that is going on around a natural health product molecules. Um, I believe it's just going to be uh, a reality in this field that if we are going to, to move forward and receive sufficient funding, that there will be certain uh, natural health products that if we can identify uh, at the molecular level certain components that are active, we will see some drug, de drug development around it. In terms of the ethics and the morality of uh, putting a patent on things like DNA and natural substances, um, you know, that's something I think really the philosophers and the ethicists need to be battling out uh, about. Yeah. Dr. Tsui, do you, have you come across this at all where you, you know, others get f lots of funding and you don't because you're not looking at something that can be patented? Yeah, I want to echo what Linda Bonneves uh, mentioned. So, Teresa Tsui here. I, 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 I agree. Um, it is more difficult to um, to obtain funding in complementary and alternative medicine research. Um, there are foundations that will uh, grant um, some some donations, um, and federal agencies also um, are you know increasingly looking at um, you know funding complementary and integrative medicine. And I think if we can I guess provide more evidence for um, natural health products and therapies that work and will help save the healthcare system money, I think there's more potential for, for future research. Tracy, have you ever felt pressure in your practice running an apothecary to take some things off the shelves that you think should be on the shelves, anything like that? Um, it does happen. I, I don't, I, I don't want to discuss the specific mm -hmm. instances, but um, I, I want to take a very, very broad perspective here and say that from an indigenous perspective, it is genocidal and disastrous to uh, allow the door to open to patenting traditional medicine. When I use the word traditional medicine, I mean medicine that people, plant medicine that people have used for millennia. Um, and, I, and I refer to the doctoring that, that we do in our society now as conventional. Um, so when, when I say uh, when I say it's 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 you know disastrous and genocidal, I mean that um, I would not leave it to the ethicists and the philosophers. Sounds a very academic forum to the ethicists and philosophers to decide who owns human traditional medicine. Human traditional medicine, you know, is. Uh, is, is from one point of view a gift from the Creator to us as human beings and and that cannot be made into a business and it, it cannot be owned by a corporation. And there, there are very many smarter, sure. better people than me like Vandana Shiva in India mm -hmm. and um, very, very many uh, legit activists who who are echoing this, this point of view that it's disastrous. Mm -hmm. Uh, in in point of fact, though, um, pharmaceutical companies are already, you know, in the rainforests, you know, harvesting plants and plant matter. And um, you mentioned digitalis. Uh, uh, Linda, do you want to uh, to weigh in a little bit more on based on what Tracy's saying? You know. Yeah, I'm I'm, I'm definitely not in favor of biopiracy, where we do see um, companies going into traditional, um, you know, healing situations. And, and taking formulas and natural, um, you know, combination therapies and, and taking advantage of that uh, to the detriment of indigenous populations. I am, you know, very strongly against that. I have worked with colleagues in Canada and elsewhere that have very strong standards around being respectful of that indigenous knowledge and ensuring that those communities determine where that knowledge goes. However, as a, an oncology practitioner, uh, I have seen... Um, 
the lives that have been saved when you have something like the Pacific yew tree uh, and its component uh, being, uh, you know, made into the medication Taxol, which is used in treating advanced breast cancer. Uh, there's no way that we have enough Pacific yew uh, trees in this world to treat the number of women that are suffering from breast cancer. And without the drug development work around that molecule, um, people would suffer. So there, there, there has to be a balance, um, and I do think there needs to be a conversation around it, but I think we can't, you know, stand on either side of that debate when we're really looking at the well-being of, of, of humans uh, on this earth. Okay. Just to, to move on from that, and thank you all for weighing in, uh, education. I mean, it, it seems to me, just as a consumer, that it's still the case where if you go to your GP, how, how, you know, how well they're informed or not, they spend a lot of time reading traditional medical journals to keep on top of what they're doing from the Western perspective. Um, you're not going to hear from them, or most of them, uh, well, here, you can take this drug or... Uh, conversely, you can, you know, uh, do aromatherapy, A, Y, or, you know, or Z uh, alternatives. Is this a question of education? Do we want to get to a point where our traditional MD um, at the point of first contact, our GP, let's say, uh, has, you know, in front of him or her, a, you know, alternative as well as traditional Western medicine? And how do we get there if that's where we want to go? Um, Dr. Tsui, do you want to start in on that? Well, I think this is changing, too, with interprofessional education um, ongoing across the various health professions uh, here at U of T. I know that, um, you know, medical doctors, nurses, pharmacists, social workers, dentists are all being cross-trained in what the other people do, and they uh, have... Um, training on some complementary and alternative medicine, and I think it can be improved upon. I, I think the Center for Integrative Medicine holds great potential for, um, you know, more education. Um, and I also think that it is um, also professional respect, too. I work with GPs in um, in my clinical practice, and I, I get referrals from them. They, they know that, you know, this is outside of my scope, um, and I'm going to refer you to see someone else who is, um, can, you know, educate you on, on natural health products or who can counsel your diet. So I think that knowing what other professions do can really help uh, improve the healthcare system overall and improve what, what patients are getting. Yeah, Professor Balneves? Yeah, I would echo what Teresa said. You know, we really are seeing a shift in interprofessional education. Um, I think there needs to be more work done across the different conventional health professionals where there's respectful conversations with patients around their interest in complementary medicine, that we have better linkages with our complementary medicine practitioner and, and professional colleagues so that there is that uh, an official referral process. And where we see therapies that, you know, for example, something like acupuncture, you know, and its effect on managing something like chronic pain, I would love to see more family physicians that are able to have the appropriate training and education uh, to be able to offer those therapies to a wider audience through their practices. Uh, but at the same time, being respectful of the practitioners that, you know, have training in that field and making sure that we're not co-opting those therapies without the appropriate respect and education. In a kind of weird way, though, Professor, I, I mean, I, maybe this is part of colonization and this larger topic, but uh, it seems to me that even places like China, for and Tracy was talking about, you know, we've got 5,000 years of history of Chinese medicine, and yet somehow even there, Western medicine has taken a foothold, and now Western medicine is increasing in popularity in places where acupuncture came from. Um, do you see the reverse happening, uh, you know, where Western medicine is kind of taking over in places where traditional medicine has been part of the fabric? I, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I just came from uh, Hong Kong in September, and you know, I was quite intrigued with how, it's, particularly in Hong Kong, Western medicine has really, you know, become quite predominant. But with the shift in government, we now are seeing a resurgence in interest and use of, of Chinese medicine, and so they are very rapidly moving towards this integrative model where they have MDs that are also trained as PCM uh, physicians. So, um, you know, I think there there is this shift. But I think if you, you know, turn to groups like the WHO, they acknowledge that traditional medicines are still being used as the primary health care by the majority of the world's population. So I don't think we'll ever have that, you know, level of dominance when you, you, when you look around the world. Mm -hmm. Tracy, do you get referrals from, from GPs ever walking into your apothecary? 
I have had some and and physiotherapists, hospital setting physiotherapists, primarily around pain management um, and dermatological issues because those are two areas where um, conventional medicine throws its hands up very often and says, I can't help you anymore. Um, Yeah. And I'm very keen to refer people to the the thing that will help them the most i'm not interested you know the phrase if you only have a hammer everything starts to look like a nail i don't want to be one of those people i when i meet somebody i want to lay the cards on the table and say here are the options that i see for you um and and have a discussion first about which which uh which the person's most interested in pursuing and Which you, options? I, I mean, again, this is, comes back to the education piece, I guess, for all of our healthcare practitioners, uh, whether Western or traditional, but uh, that they both have they have the tools on both sides of that to make referrals and to, you know, continue. And do you see? Do you see, Doctor Sui? Do you see, you know, nurses trained the traditional way or doctors trained the traditional way, picking up nat- uh, naturopathy, for example? Is that happening, or, or the the reverse? Do you see doctors of naturopathy? taking traditional Western medical degrees as well? Does, is that happening? Do those people exist in Toronto? They do exist. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, in, in yeah, my colleagues, there are some registered nurses who have chosen to become naturopathic doctors and may also continue to become dual registrants and practice nursing. There are also uh, increasingly some international medical graduates who have chosen the uh, naturopathic doctorate route as well. So there is a, a program at the Naturopath College to train foreign trained uh, physicians. Okay, we just have a few minutes left. And so I want to start with you, Professor Balnews. Thanks so much for calling in. So what's ahead for you? What What do you think is going to make a difference to all of our health's, uh, healths in the next few years uh, coming out of the work that you're doing? Mm-hmm. What do you aim for? Well, yeah, number one, I really think it is about, uh, you know, doing education with our conventional healthcare providers here at the University of Toronto, increasing their awareness of the popularity and the use of complementary medicine, making them more aware of the evidence base that exists and how they can properly support patients either through referral or for receiving training themselves in being able to use these therapies in an effective and safe manner. Part of that, though, is we need to be developing the, the research to support that evidence. And so I really hope that our center is going to generate, uh, you know, interest and, and funding that will be able to support our researchers in, in really exploring these therapies, the promising ones, and, and finding the evidence that we require in order to get these into our scopes of practice and ensuring that it's something that we can put into our healthcare system. Are you researching something at the moment that you want to give us a hint about? Um, I'm actually, most of my research has been around knowledge translation, so I'm actually right now doing a research study uh, looking specifically at uh, best practice guidelines and how to support practitioners in assessing and talking to patients in oncology settings around complementary medicine. Okay. We just have a very quick, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for being on the line. Uh, Tracy, you. you want to write a book on the placebo effect? Is that <laughs> forthcoming? No, it's not, but I am, I am coming up with a book soon um, about uh, how to make her... At helping people to uh, make their own natural, uh, traditional um, body care and and uh, daily care products. Okay, and Dr. Sui, what's next for you? Are you is there a particular research project that you're excited about right now or upcoming? Yes, I'm applying for the PhD program, as I mentioned, and I'm interested in patient-reported outcomes as as one area. I'm interested in knowledge translation as well, um, and also just um, maybe practice-based research. Right. Yeah. So, so hopefully, when you walk into your MD, uh, you're going to have somebody who's going to make referrals to a doctor of naturopathy. Who's going to talk about alternatives and even.